and begin to make and begin to make um, uh, sense of what this means for, for investors and the practices of investing in terms of groups coming together and and uh, and collaborating and, and funding whatever it is their mission is. So that's the fun stuff. We get to the end. The last third of this, I think, is going to be the the, fun, the funnest part. And I think so we, can, with, we, we can connect all the dots. Fine. Yeah, and with people like you on here, Joel on here, Michael Mola on here, um, the wealth of knowledge in this space is pretty epic. So have as many questions as you have queued up uh, for when we get to that point today. I think you can dive in, Alan. We're recording. Really? Okay. I'll all pop right. people in as they get in. <clears throat> okay. Here we go. So I like to, um, so this is the, the now the fifth part of the series. Um, and this, uh, so the, the, the fun part about this session is that we finally get to the last part of the tokens and we can finally start looking at, uh, at them in their totality, right? Um, and begin to make sense out of what this means for, for investors or, or groups of builders to come together and provide funding and pursue some sort of initiative together. Um, because the way that uh, the capital raising is happening through communities in this space is very different from the way that we typically view the VC environment. So we'll finally be able to get to that point at the end, which is, is fun. Um, and this topic I think is really fascinating because out of all the tokens, the DAOs are the ones that are the most open-ended. Um, they, um, which I'll get to in, in, in a minute. But um, just to recap, just to kind of kick things off. I'm gonna, so, you know, the whole point of the Web3 is that we're witnessing this emergence of an economy of ideas for the third generation of the internet. And just to kind of recap for everyone, we're talking about a group of technologies that encompasses blockchains, cryptographic protocols, digital assets, decentralized finance, decentralized social platforms, non-fungible tokens, and distributed autonomous organizations like we're going over today. And um, when we combine these with smart glasses that we will see coming out over the course of the next five years, the merge augmented reality and virtual reality with a physical reality, we kind of get this inescapable metaverse or what we're calling the third generation of the internet. And together these technologies will serve as the basis for new forms of economic and social interactions arising from self-governed communities, allow people to collaborate, create and exchange and take ownership of their digital identity and assets. For the first time in human history, we look upon an infinite digital frontier combined with the technologies for communities to organize, own, fund, create, and self-govern a global economy of ideas. Um, you know, I think digital freedom to all of this means uh, the freedom to associate online and to speak freely and privately online, to, to transact freely and privately. Um, when we talk about these organizations, we're talking about, this is another way of saying communities, we're talking about collections of people. And um, so I want to just briefly list, what do we mean by this? It's really a broad term. It means any group of people. It could be obviously a company. It could be a nonprofit. It could be a church or a political party. It could be a nation, a state, a city, a county, especially if there are taxes. It could be a book club. It could be a music club. It could be a sports club. It could be a, a sports league. It could be a video game. Um, it could be any group we see on a social platform. And what's interesting is that over the last, say, year and a half, we've noticed some interesting trends. Like, for instance, if, if you can grow a, a community to about 40,000 members, then they can form into these uh, DAOs and they can raise millions of dollars to do anything the community wants to do. And it's fascinating because there's no more gatekeepers. We don't need governments to issue IDs. We don't need governments to issue currencies. We don't need, uh, of course, there's all kinds of legal issues. Um, but, but fundamentally, when you look at sort of the mathematics of it and the science of it, the gatekeepers are eliminated now. Um, and so we're seeing this, this blossoming of different kinds of, of, of communities. Um, and the important thing about this is digital space. I like to take these images. And uh, I'm kind of visual. I like to see things kind of in pictures. And to me, this kind of it visualizes this idea of a digital frontier. Um, it's infinite. It's really important to conceptualize that when we're looking at this space. Um, unlike in the physical world where we run out of physical space, 
and that creates you know all these kinds of resource limitations and movement limitations. Uh, uh, in the digital space, it truly is infinite. What that means is, is that people can leave a community if they, it's not working for them, or they don't believe in how it's being governed, or the values deviate from their values, uh, or it doesn't provide a very good service at a very good price, any number of reasons. Um, and they can leave those communities and they can go form new ones. And this can just happen infinitely. Um, let's see. So there's several things that we're trying to communicate here, I guess, in, in the series. One of them is that I want everyone to understand that there, there are many layers to these opportunities available to entrepreneurs and investors from the, within the Web3 stack. Um, there are many opportunities. Um, there are many more opportunities than just gambling in this big kind of online uh, uh, casino, coin casino. Um, and, and I want everyone to be able to think about, uh, about this space like a product manager, to be able to identify sort of the best and early opportunities. And I also want everyone to understand why Web3 investing continue to reward the earliest investors and only the earliest investors with unusually high returns. This is kind of a repeating theme and there's the reason why this is happening. And we're gonna get into the technology and explain kind of why that is. Um, I always start these sessions with this slide. I think this is how product managers think. And I like to kind of go over some of the foundational ideas. And on this slide, we have a collection of different th thought leaders uh, talking about how society adopts ideas uh, and technologies. Um, and two of the uh, sort of um, foundational ones is this blue one, the law diffusion of, of innovation, where we have innovators and then early adopters, then we have this kind of a chasm. Uh, and then is, I like to think of it as like people that dance, right? There are people that get on the dance floor first, when no one else is dancing. These, that's these people. Then there are people that will only dance when someone else is dancing, and that's these people, right? And then there are people that get on a little later, and then there are people that will only dance when a majority of people are dancing, because now they're in the minority. That feels kind of weird, right? So they come along then. And then this last group, they probably don't dance at all until someone drags them onto, onto, the, onto the, the dance floor. So we see this in human behavior and in societies and in the adoption of ideas and technologies. Uh, this yellow line is, um, <clears throat> this is to me is like a product thing. You, these, all these technology, uh, technologies in general go through a genesis by the innovators. Then they go through a custom build phase by the early adopters to, to see if it actually solves problems. And then if it does, we'll see it go through a productization phase and a scaled adoption phase. And then if it's, and this will be a competition, right? We'll see, we'll see lots of companies jumping in and efforts to, to, be this, to be this scaled adoption of this product. And eventually the ones that get the product and the market right and the timing right will eventually kind of move through this curve into a commodity state. And it's, it's, it's curious because what happens in technology when you reach this state is that the, the technology now is ubiquitous. It's, it's now a component inside other systems that are more sophisticated. And this just goes and goes and goes and goes. And then Gartner uh, with the fantastic research organization, most big enterprises don't buy anything without getting external research from companies like Forrester and Gartner. But Gartner has this thing called a hype cycle. And what they're saying here is that the innovators always overhype an idea. And then as people are trying to use it, then you find out what's really wrong with it. And the reality is often something in between, especially when you go through this productization phase and you really solve all these problems. So the reason why I wanna go through this is because um, as investors, right, we're looking for this, usually this right here at this point where we can, we, we can achieve scaled adoption if we can build the right product at the right time with the right go-to-market. So this is a way to kind of align everyone around, you know, we, we know how to ask the right questions to see if we're, we're doing the right thing at the right time, right? Um, let me see, any other notes in this? Yeah, that's about it. Oh, um, one more thing. <laughs> and I say this on all, on all the, the, the things. I'm not a financial expert, so none of this is, is financial advice, right, right Aaron? <laughs> yeah, and then, um, 
and I'm a product manager. I have to, I have to confess, I'm a product manager. I'm a generalist. I'm not a specialist. I'm not a cryptographer. I'm not a finance expert like Joel. I'm not a lawyer like Mike. Um, my job is to communicate to people what these technologies are and how they can really solve problems and how we can achieve scaled adoption. This is what I do. I, 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 I try and figure out when is this, when is this, this, this breakthrough point? And I have to explain it to people, right? So like, as we go through this uh, market share adoption, the way you talk to people, just like getting people to dance, right? You have to talk to them differently as you're talking to the next group of people. And that's what product management marketing really is about, is, is how to move, move this, this adoption curve. Uh, another uh, point in terms of the, the background ideas, um, we, uh, we talk a lot about, I, I found this works well to explain the, these blockchains uh, and as mathematical devices. That they're made up of cryptographic um, uh, machines, if you will. They're, they're, they're mathematics. They only work a certain way. They're very rigid, if you will. And when you look at all the different blockchains and protocols and different efforts in, in Web3, what they're doing is they're, they're assembling mm -hmm. these, these kind of mathematical devices. Things like... Um, oh, uh, just from... Yeah, good. Oh, hey, I'm sorry, guys. I'm listening, but I I was trying to mute it, and I'm, I don't. I'll hey, Yeager, yeah. <laughs> you're good, man. <laughs> That's Scott Yeager. Uh, but by the way, um, uh, Scott has some fascinating intellectual property around. Um, uh, uh, he's patented uh, us owning our data, where we don't have to rely on governments to actually. So, so it, it's an assertion of the ownership of our identity and data that's based on patent and contract law. It's fascinating. Thank you, Scott, for, for being here. So, um, so anyway, so we're talking about these mathematical devices. So like proof of work, you'll hear people talk about proof of work or proof of stake. These are mathematical devices. They only work a certain way. And that, that, that lets a blockchain, the, the, these uh, uh, trusted computing it, it solutions, you can think of this almost like an evolution in computing. Uh, we can now, uh, we now have cryptographers who've been working on these sort of mathematical devices for decades, and they now have reached a, a point where the software developers can build things with them, just like Lego blocks. And so all the blockchains are basically different variations of these mathematical devices assembled in different ways. That's a nice, convenient way of thinking about them. Uh, when you're looking at them, you should be asking yourself, what is the, what is the, the structure of this thing? And why do they make those choices? And what are the benefits and what are the potential downsides? Um, so it's important that this, this is, I think, uh, yeah, this is, some, this is foundational. So um, I like to also, like I like pictures, right? So this was, we've been talking about blockchains and these mathematical devices. This is a, a really simplified example of kind of describing this as a big ledger in the sky. So we have our public and private keys. Um, what's interesting about this is um, we're dealing, we're dealing, it's a mathematical device. We're just dealing with numbers that work a certain way. It's sort of like a law of nature. Um, in fact, it's kind of, it's a good way of thinking about it. Um, once someone invents these, 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 these cryptographic devices, you can't really uninvent them. And we're sort of stuck with, oh, well, someone just invented a device that does this. There's some examples of them. Uh, I was talking about this. So the, there's proof of stake, proof of work. We have uh, other ones that deal with privacy, which we'll talk about in another session. Uh, that's zero knowledge proofs and secure multi-party computation. Those are also I know, other kinds of mathematical devices. Uh, we can use these things to secure communication between two points. We can use these things to know if the communication has been altered between the two points, on and on and on. It's fascinating. Um, but it's just numbers and we have to give those numbers meaning, right? And so this is where the idea of, of these token standards exists. Think of these as a smart contract template. Think about the contracts that, uh, that you have in, uh, in your world, uh, things like a will or a lease or a purchase or a receipt, all sorts of things like that. Um, we have to insert dates and numbers and names into it, right? That's what these templates are doing. So we're taking the mathematical device and we're saying, okay, we're gonna agree with the standard with ERC-20 that it's fungible. With 721, it's non-fungible. With 1155, it can be fungible or non-fungible. 
on and on and on. Uh, 2981 is a way to, to, to do royalties, which we talked about why that doesn't work and how we're helping to solve that. So with, I'm sorry. with DAOs, yeah. Alan, I'm sorry, uh, I apologize for uh, uh, interrupting here, but what did we, I don't remember talking about why the royalties can't work at the moment, why they're trying to get it resolved. What's the issue with it? Yeah, there's two. Uh, so there's an infinite number of blockchains and communities, right? So just because you registered an asset on one, yeah, if it gets resold on that same blockchain, you'll get your royalty. If someone goes and registers it on sells on another blockchain, you won't. Um, the, so we need a layer two protocol that works across blockchains to help solve that. The other thing is that they, they'll play loose with, the NFT advocates will play loose with, the, with this idea of a royalty. They'll, they'll refer to this as a license. Licenses are transient. They end. They have terms. They can't do that. But yet, you'll still see in, in articles and NFT advocates talking about this being a licensing mechanism. It, it, it's a very primitive licensing mechanism that only works for all transactions on the blockchain that the original asset was registered for. And that's it. Is that good, Max? Thanks. Yeah, that explains it. Good. Thank you. Thank you. So, um to go down there we go so this is um on previous sessions we talked about six sort of reoccurring problems with web one web two and web three the, what, the things we're seeing in web three uh the solutions to problems have both pros and cons and and what's interesting about it is is it's the same set of problems uh that we've seen uh from web one web two and web three and it's important to go back and to recall and to remember, roll the clock back to like you know, 25 years ago. The web was originally stateless and it was anonymous. The community was global. And we had standards bodies that largely worked on hardware at the time to actually wire up the internet, right? They were, were increasingly becoming software standards bodies. And uh, in order to make money on this, we had to sort of solve this state problem. We, we used cookies and then we got very fun and we added third party cookies, which allowed for third party surveillance. Everyone loved that, right? This is the age of, you know, uh, data is the new oil, right? But we didn't have any way to assert our identities. And so we had these massive uh, uh, intermediaries, these, these platforms that came along and, and because they controlled our identities, they were, they, they were the only place in which we could create communities. And then they controlled the protocols as proprietary protocols. So like, um, you know, this is an example of, um, you know, when Google changes their algorithm or when Amazon changes how they're doing their business or Facebook changes how you know, their algorithm works and influencers suddenly have a harder time making money on and on and on. Um, these I'm platforms- sorry. Would that also be the same as like the, the, those, the big ERPs like SAP and Oracle and any of those other uh, business resource planning? Um, or will they ever migrate to, towards a blockchain environment? That's a really good question. Um, th that, th these two environments are very separated right now. Um, and I think people are looking for those folks. And um, the protocol that we're proposing, we have uh, a leading data governance platform that is, um, that is uh, uh, assigned a letter of intent and we're in the process of doing a proposal to co-develop the technology and, and to bring it into market. They, they work with the leading Fortune 100 companies in banking and insurance and pharma and telco and retail. So to answer your question, really, no, no one's really found a way to bring in uh, blockchain technology into, into enterprises like you described with, with, with like ERP systems. But I can tell you from people in the data governance space, there's three areas where they see an opportunity. One is with um, AI classification of data within the enterprise. The other one is with data lineage and data tracing, being able to keep, keep track of, of the data as it moves around in its history. Um, and the third one is the use of all the privacy enhancing technologies, the zero knowledge proofs, secure multi computation, uh, differential privacy, federated learning. Well, actually, have a whole, the, 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 it's called PETS. 
privacy incident analogies, we have a whole session to go into all those to talk about the actual use cases. But the, the, the capacity to use those uh, for all the data as, as it's being moved around. So thank you for that, Max. That's that's very few Web3 project, projects have patents and have uh, uh, a plan to, to, to capture enterprise revenue. To your point, there's, there's really there's really just really a massive separation. Um, uh, Joel and and uh, Mark. This, is really, really hey, uh, well, this is Scott, Scott. You mind if I jump in real quick? Sure. I was just at uh, NFT LA a week ago, and, I, and then I was at the tail end of uh, Bitcoin in Miami, and, but I went to what was called Blockchain Miami, which is a two-day, much smaller group of people. What I'm picking up on is everybody's very consumer-facing, and what they're talking about is building communities and doing all this. NF the NFT future is around building communities to interface with consumers and help them monetize that. But there's a very strong opinion that the enterprise <clears throat> will engage with the audiences of the consumers using NFTs in a loyalty building way. Yeah. Um, and, and in that sense, I don't have a clue though what they would think about ERP stuff. So I don't really have an answer to the question, but I'm just giving you what I gleaned from the most recent things I went to. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, yeah, we, we talked about all the NFT use cases and you're right there, they, they tend to be um, a, a very consumer focus uh, and art focus. And then in the second session, um, we actually tore that down actually. We, we spent an entire hour explaining why, why that, all the problems in that space, all the overhype in that space and, and, and the problems that need to be solved. But uh, in the second session, we talked about NFTs and we talked about all the digital twin stuff. We talked about all the, all the potential of it. So, uh, but yeah, right now it's very consumer focused. Um, and to your point, Max, you're right. The, 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 we're still looking at how we're going to integrate these two systems, these two kind of ecosystems. Um, and that's something that I think we're, we're, we're specializing in. So, um, but let's, let's get into DAOs <laughs> uh, real quick. So, because that's what we're talking about. So the, the interesting thing about the DAOs is that they are, um, the, what's happening is that they're using this cryptographic device, right? And they're, they're making a token standard, but it's not really a standard. It, in fact, the, the, the smart contracts are wildly varied um, because what they're doing is, is they're wanting to take the, um, some percentage and in some cases, all of it, the bylaws of the organization and all the functions of management and implement it on, on in smart contracts. These are bewilderingly, I say bewilderingly, that compared to the, to the traditional contracts with very simple if-then statements, uh, trying to capture an organization's uh, bylaws, implement them in smart contracts is a much more complicated thing. Um, just like the NFTs, we're gonna have people who are, who are maximalists, who are, who are heavy advocates. Uh, these would be people who would say, let's automate everything. There's literally no board, there's no management. This begs all kinds of legal questions when the organization has members all around the world, and depending on what the, what the organization is attempting to do. Um, uh, but the people that are the maximalists who are pushing the capabilities of the technology don't want to be impaired by reality, and that's fine. That's what they're doing as innovators. They're the ones that will only live out here. They want to push the technology. They want to invent. So there's there's a good bit of that happening. Um, and then there's the more practical side of things where we say, all right, you know, we live in a legal world. We need to have a board. We need to have, uh, you know, we, we might have intellectual property involved. We might get sued. We might have to sue people. We need a management team. And to run a to run a uh, an organization, you need organizational leadership, right? So, uh, in, what's happening in that case is the voting mechanism is just being used on, um, on, the, uh, on the code base. What they're saying is that we're not gonna change the code. Unlike, you know, we just talked about Facebook and Google and Amazon and all these major intermediate platforms, they can change the code at any time. And if you're dependent upon them for your living, that's a scary thing. But if you can build an organization that can build some kind of platform in this manner, that won't generally happen. I mean, you, the, the, nothing in the code changes without a proposal, without uh, a vote, without development and deployment. So we're dealing with a, with a, a community created intermediary that's totally transparent. 
and it's 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 and there's a range of ways in which people are, are are taking the bylaws and the functions of management and the board and automating it in the in the smart contract. So what we're seeing is kind of the opposite of these token standards with DAOs. DAOs are almost individually unique in in the manner in which you know what they're trying to accomplish and the extent to which they're automating function management functions on, on, in smart contracts. So you one could say this is the area where there's the most experimentation and there's the most the most pushing of the technology. It's kind of fascinating. Um, so there's so this is just from like last week. There's some 4,200 DAOs that have been created successfully that, they, that are operating and running. They they've collected more than nine billion in their treasuries from their from their members. No, no. Uh, there's while the blockchain is highly regulated, right? Because the code's transparent, the human behaviors are not. So we have no regulation effectively over over this in terms of the human behaviors. Uh, and it's and it's working for the most part. Now when we talk about the mathematical devices and um, and how they only work one way. That, that's that's and how that creates a usability problem. And where we see problems in this space where, is where we see everywhere. It's the same kind of problems you see everywhere throughout the web space, which is that if you make a mistake, if you send a million dollars to the wrong wallet, you may not you may never know who that is. You may you may never know what country they're in. It's gone. It's like sending, it's like Western Union cash. And you can do it with the accident of tapping a button. So, you know, that's a, um, that's a reality of this. But it's still, despite those problems, it's, it's massive. It's massive. It's solving a, a massive unmet need in the marketplace. We're dealing with, uh, you know, these are some of the top DAO tokens. Many of them have to do with lending. We're going to talk to Ave in a bit. Um, but we're talking, you know, billions of dollars in market cap. And the ecosystem is rapidly evolving. This is just one of many snapshots that I grabbed. I can't even tell if this is everything. I know this is everything. I think one would have to update this on a daily basis. But we have, uh, you know, we have media DAOs, we have collector DAOs, where people are um, are uh, or, or forming into communities and they're raising funds and they're doing it to go out and collect things, so that because they think that those things are going to go up in value later. There are grant DAOs where people are pooling money, uh, usually for some kind of social social need or social focus, and they're giving out grants. There are investment DAOs. There's service DAOs, social DAOs. There's protocol DAOs, like Aave is the lending protocol. There's even uh, uh, web-based platforms that you can you can manage your DAO with. You can tell all your users to go to to log on to Aragon and log on to your company and the, and, and all the proposals, all the all the voting, uh, all, everything is there. They can be, basically it's, it's how to run a DAO as a service. So we're dealing with a, a rapidly evolving kind of a landscape. Um, and when we when we look at this proposal voting development and uh, and deployment model that we're that we're sort of looking at, it's interesting because from from a like a programmer's perspective, um, creating a DAO is uh, is barely a stone slip from what they already do. So they work in what's called a source code repository. And so if you think of a big file system with a bunch of files on it in folders. And if you have a large team of developers, they'll check out a certain set of folders and they create what's called a branch. They're creating a second copy of the code. And then at some point they have to merge that branch in. And if someone else has checked out those same files, then they have an even more complicated purge because now they have to merge code edits from the same file into the main code code branch. And what, what happens in this space, it's really funny to watch this. Um, uh, oh well. um, yeah, so w w the larger the, the, the group gets, the more complex the code gets, the more complex this, the, this process becomes. So this is a, kind of a fuzzy example of a code repository. We have over here on the left different features. And we have all the code edits over here on the right. And we have the, the different branches of the code. We have about a, a dozen or so developers. And what you're seeing here is a whole lot of branches and not a lot of merges. So at some point, this group is going to have to merge some dozen versions of code into one master branch of the code. 
This happens all the time in big software projects. And so for them to, uh, to, 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 to think that, well, let's, let's, let's vote on it is really common sense to them because they, they have a thing called a source code review where they get the whole team of developers together and they look at each other's code. And it's great for learning, but it can be really embarrassing and very difficult for younger developers. Um, this is where the, the group comes up with coding standards. They come up with coding modules that they want reused. Um, but this idea that the developers get in a room and they look at each other's code and they and they come to a consensus of what they want to how, how they're going to merge it all. They already do that. They're, they do this every day. So the idea of expanding this to to a larger community is um, is is really obvious to them. And what's also surprising is that it's obvious to us as product managers as well. So there's a, a group, a fairly prominent group been around for a long time called the Pragmatic Institute, Pragmatic Institute. And they have different uh, product management certifications. Um, every company that I've worked for as a product manager, this was sort of the go-to certification and training. And somewhere on page like four of your first class, they teach you this, this little phrase. This means nothing important happens in the office. And what they're saying is, is as product managers, no one in the organization other than us is going to get out into the marketplace and talk to customers and talk to the market and understand it. No one else is. And I can tell you guys as a product management professional that even, even working for companies that sent us to this training where we're told to spend half of our time with, our, with the customers in the market, uh, management never lets us do it. If we can get 10% of our time, we're lucky. And so what we get are these massive organizations that, that are fundamentally not customer focused. So when we go to this model, it's impossible to not be customer focused. Um, it gives the product manager now tools uh, to resolve internal politics and internal you know, challenges and, and, and risk management within the organization. And we're pushing it out to the community. We're letting the community tell us how they want us, us to spend their funds. And so these, uh, these DAOs, are, are attracting and growing communities based on how well they're actually governed. So let's let's look at some of these examples. I think I think it's it's it's, it's useful to kind of compare and contrast. And I I didn't go get logos, so I didn't have time. So we're gonna have to deal with the text logos. I'm visual. That kind of bugs me. But anyway, <laughs> um, let's look at J.P. Morgan versus Bitcoin and look at the number of employees and the transaction volume, which is you know in order of magnitude higher. The employees are in order of magnitude less. The revenue is significantly higher. The growth is higher. The market cap is significantly higher. It's interesting to compare Bitcoin to an actual bank and see what's different in sort of very basic ways. We're seeing, we're seeing a much more efficient intermediary that is charging less and operating at a larger scale with far fewer employees. This goes back to the whole mathematical device thing, right? It, it kind of only works one way. You, you can't call someone and say, oops, I've made a mistake, fix it. It's efficient. It's not very forgiving. Um, another so, comparison. Yeah, go ahead, Max. I'm sorry. Are we comparing apples to apples here? Because oh. uh, with JP with JP Morgan and Bitcoin, because not all of JP Morgan uh, uh, is in um, international or payment transactions or. Uh, they're, no, they're, it's a, it's it's an approximation. Okay, you, you're right. Yeah, but, but it, it, the okay. intent is is to kind of draw some themes from some of these comparisons, right? right? So, you know, when we look at, at PayPal and Ethereum, we're dealing with, again, we're seeing an order of magnitude fewer people, an order of you know, considerably uh, more, an order of magnitude more transaction volume, um, you know, less revenue, and massive year over growth, and considerably more market cap. We're seeing the same kind of patterns emerge. Uh, and let's, so let's look at lending, right? So, um, Lending Club, uh, 27,000 people. 4.3 billion loans originated versus 20 billion and 25 people at, at, at Aave. Uh, Aave makes money. And look at the market cap in, in four years. And you'll see this theme kind of repeat over and over and over and over again, right? Um, far fewer people, uh, far efficient of a system, faster growth. Um, but it, it comes with some with this lack of forgiveness, right? Uh, and I want to point that out because it's the kind of thing that I think is, is someone's going to solve it. 
that. Maybe it didn't layer it out right, right? Um, but uh, you can't you can't ignore these uh, these themes, right? We are okay. We're doing good on time. We're doing really good on time. Um, so let's talk. So, so okay. So we've now gone through. Um, through all these different tokens, and we kind of compare and contrast sort of the traditional uh, financial space and economic space with the digital space. And so we can now look at NFTs and DAOs and coins, and look at how they alter capital raise practices. So what we normally see in traditional venture capital is that the early investors, they'll do something with what's called a safe, it's called a simple agreement uh, for equity. Uh, they might get a 10X return in five years, right? This is kind of a typical kind of first round. Then you go into like a series A or some kind of larger round and the early investors get diluted. Then you're going to another, another series of, 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 of a round uh, and you get additional dilution over and over again. What's happening in the Web3 space is, and this is profound, these Web3 projects have two cap tables. They have an equity cap table and they have a token cap table. And it's important to think about it that way because they're actually creating we, the, the, the top VCs and now many of the sort of lead, you know, following VCs. Um, they're doing a whole lot of financial analysis on what this means um, because the tokens generally half will go to the community, another uh, quarter will go into the treasury so that the community now has funds to spend. And then another quarter will go to the early investors. So they're getting equity via safe and they're getting tokens from what's called a simple agreement for future tokens. And the same way we talked about in the previous session about some of the really cool use cases of NFTs, um, the ability to, to fractionalize the ownership of large capital assets, the ability to, uh, to, to, to move them faster throughout you know, an economic cycle, but selling a building uh, to a thousand, a thousand slices in three days uh, versus uh, to one person in three months. What's happening is we can now use these tokens, they're really liquid. And so the early investors are, uh, are able to make a return, at least their initial investment. In some cases, they're making a 10X return on these tokens, if they can generate enough demand for them prior to the launch, that there's not enough of them, there's more demand than there are, than there are tokens. So, so the early investors, they, they get equity and they get the tokens that they can liquidate after their issue. And what's fascinating is in this space, Generally speaking, you can't get early investors until you have that product market fit, right? In traditional investing, they want you to be, they want you to be here. They want to come in when you're at that growth phase where you've proven product market fit. You've got products, you've got customers, you've got metrics. So what happens to startups through this process? Well, they, they starve. So in Web3, what's happening is, um, these early investors are investing in equity and tokens on a white paper. Some of them are as short as 15 pages and they're raising $10 million in equity that they then turn around and raise, uh, you know, 30, $50 million in tokens. It's fascinating because they've got two cap tables. And this allows these, the, the, these early innovators to fund the projects early, early, early in the process, before the product's built, before you've proven product market fit. And if they're successful with the token offering, well, this is really interesting. Um, they're getting equity plus the tokens. And because it's the community funding the next phase of the development of the project, there's no equity dilution. There's no equity available to anyone else. And then if they launch a platform, they'll, in many cases, there'll be transaction fees, there'll be ways of incentivizing behaviors, penalizing behaviors to, 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 to earn, earn, earn revenue. We call that tokenomics. And you can, in generally, generally speaking, you can now raise an order of magnitude more money. It's in some cases, we have hundreds of millions of dollars being, being raised at, at this round, like, like ICOs. Again, no equity dilution, no equity available to anyone else. And so what happens is we haven't seen this yet, but when one of these one of these projects gets sold, it's really the only early, it's really the only early investors that will, that, will, that will make any money. The, the token holders that came in here and here, their their token may go up and may go down. No one knows. And so what's happening 
is these early investors, the people that, that come in and invest early in the process, we'll go back to, 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 to our product management picture, that invest here. The, the, traditional investing says, well, I, I like lower risk and I want to invest at a later date. That, that was fine with, with old school VC and old school capital raising, but not with Web3. Not what we're seeing yet. Now, a couple of years from now, as these projects evolve, who knows? Um, uh, we can kind of predict that some of them that struggle may turn to raise more equity, but then you got to ask yourselves, why would you want to invest in them if they struggle to build a community that could fund them? This is, this is some really interesting things are going to evolve over the next three to five years. Um, and, uh, and with that, I'm going to kind of pause, and I think we're going to just shift to some questions, Aaron, and then in the last five minutes, we'll, we'll come back to this topic of it. All right, I'm going to drop the drop the screen, Alan, so we can see people. Yeah. And uh, yeah, any questions, curiosities, concerns, any input, um, especially well, the, of the ones that I know, uh, Joel, Mike, um, and any input from anybody else that I don't necessarily know your level of understanding of this. But if you want to raise your hand virtually, you can. If you want to raise your hand literally, you can. And I will watch and we'll open it up. So who would like to go first? Wow. Alan, it looks like you just blew their minds enough to have no questions. Right. <laughs> right. Mike just unmuted. Let's hear from Mike. <laughs> hey, everyone. Alan, fantastic presentation, really. Um, congrats. Thank you. So I, I could just say, you know, <clears throat> not sure how much of this is sinking in for, for all of us, you know, especially if hearing it the first time, but I can't uh, explain how important it is. I've been an angel investor and early investor in companies for, for almost a decade now. And Lately, I've been investing in, in Web3 and doing three things through DAOs, as Alan just explained, and more and more exponentially, it's growing. And you can see the results. You can see the benefits when, like you just talked about, you have the two different cap tables, you're able to invest in equity, simultaneously uh, having tokens, and then being able to use market makers and different things with the tokens to be able to earn money for the company before it almost becomes like a self-crowdfunding situation. And these companies are just skyrocketing. So this is all really an incredible opportunity for, for people to start realizing that the potential of this technology. So thanks, Alan, for bringing it to us that way. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, I, to I totally agree. Alan, this is, this is a really great session. Uh, one of the things that I'd probably just add in the mix, and Mike, I like what you said, is, is keep learning. And we have such an amazing treasure treasure chest really of of resources here in in bellwether and in this community just to understand there's a lot of misinformation out in the marketplace and a lot of mythology and it's it's funny just even just today uh jack dorsey was back in the news uh you know marketing one of his nfts and i was I was paying attention to a, a Bitcoin maximalist thread and the gal was saying, oh, I guess NFTs are over. The fad is over. And I'm like, mm -hmm. I didn't respond. I was just like, there's so much information out there that is just not correct about where things are trending. Um, we're still so, so early in, in this Web3 evolution. And, and this is just this, this presentation on DAOs is absolutely amazing. Thank you. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, the, 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 I, I like seeing, and I'm more, I like to think about what's being argued about. I'm, I'm less concerned really about what the, I mean, I, yeah, I'm curious what the argument is, but to me, it's more telling what the argument's about. Right? Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's normal to have people that are maximalists, that, that's, that are playing loose with the ideas, the most creative people on the cutting edge of, of the technology, advocating for its potential, right? They don't care that you know, there's details. They're not going to worry about that. They're too busy with the big ideas and pushing the envelope. And then the rest of us are sort of like, well, we got to use it. <laughs> it's got to work. <laughs> you know, so these, these real problems re really, really exist and they really matter. And, and you all know people in, in, your, in your life that no matter, uh, I think those of us um, often that are really innovative and creative, I think we often get paired up with people who are more risk averse and more stable and, and more and slower moving. Um, and, and we all know people in our lives that if you told them you're gonna do something really kind of nuts, they just, they would, they would, they would talk endlessly about all the reasons why you shouldn't do it. <clears throat> you know, they're very risk averse people. And, and that's normal in society. We, we kind of need that to happen. We need, we need people to be resistant to change and then other people who are going to push it. Uh, and so 
it, it's normal to hear a range of opinions on things. Um, I think what we want to look at when we're looking at that is, is, is you know, what's broken and, and how can we fix it, right? Like the potential is real, but the problems are real too, because that's the opportunity space. That's how I look at it as a product manager. And I think as investors, it's a very, it's a very good way to look at the space as well. You know, as a, as a kind of just a uh, story, a quick on, on this topic with regard to the power of DAOs, uh, there was something that happened, Alan and, and Joel, you'll probably remember a few months back where there was something called Constitution DAO. And there are, I think, 12 copies of the U.S. Constitution uh, that, that, that exist, and only two of them are uh, not private that, that are for sale, and one was going to go up for sale. And so a couple of uh, individuals got together and created this constitution DAO. And I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it was going to uh, auction at about $25 million. So they had to raise $25 million in two days. And it ended up that they, they by creating this DAO, raised $40 million and were able to go in and bid. And almost within you know a couple of days, uh, a group of individuals were able to purchase mm -hmm. the constitution for almost $40 million. They got outbid for 45 or so. But the point is that, you know, for the first time in history of a group of individuals who don't know each other that effectively raised about $40 million in two or three days. So to, that shows the, the potential and the power of these. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Yeah. When people with like mind, like you said, most of these people probably didn't know each other at all, <laughs> but they had, they had a common goal and they had a common cause. And it's amazing what people with that type of energy can do. I have a, a question about the DAOs funding, increasing their funding via tokens. Do the tokens have a stated value or are the, is the value of each individual token related to the overall capital value of the enterprise since only the early inventors, adopters, developers retain the equity. So is there a stated value per token is a basically what I, or an assumed value or a given value or whatever um, for the people yeah. that, that, that buy into it? They, they, um, they do them, they, they are able to do a fairly accurate assessment of the, of the interest in the token by the number of people in the community um the the people that have done like uh, you know a hundred a uh, hundred of these of over nfts and coin offerings and, and, and DAOs. um excuse me <clears throat> they're saying that you need about a, a community of about forty thousand people minimum um and then that's kind of the tipping point threshold where you, you, you get enough critical mass that you can you can you can launch something that that is is producing the kind of numbers that that mike is talking about and scott was talking about um they they get to decide just like stock you get to decide how much you're going to issue. And if you issue too much, uh, the price is going to go down. If you issue too, too little of it, the price is going to go up. So it's a, um, it's a fluid market. Uh, now you, you can create synthetic, there are ways of creating what are called stable coins. And on, in our session two, Joel talked about, about that. Mm -hmm. So we have a whole session that kind of talks about, about the coins and uh, the different kinds and, uh, and how they're used for payments. And, why we need stable coins versus these, these fluctuating coins and fluctuate value. The, the reason why you want some of these things to float is because they're acting as a supply and demand mechanism within the marketplace. So like how it's kind of like a Bitcoin miners, uh, they mine, they mine uh, a Bitcoin and they get rewarded for doing so. But what they're doing is they're providing transactional verification and finality uh, um, uh, for, the, for the people who want to conduct transactions with the blockchain. So, it's a, there's a supply and demand. It's like, it's like uh, uh, Uber or Airbnb. It's a two-sided marketplace. You've got, you've got buyers and suppliers. And the intermediary is acting as a, as, a, as, a, as a marketplace for the buyers and suppliers. So if there's not enough drivers, then, um, then Uber will increase what it costs for the, for the riders. Right. And so Uber will use the, will, will vary the, the rates on a, on a minute by minute basis to try and balance supply and demand of the drivers to, to, to the riders in, in a given area. Um, and there's a lot of math that goes into that uh, from what I understand. So all, I think all the same techniques are being used inside the, these communities. They're, um, the people that are, that are first into this space were gamers. And so many of the gamers that play games that are programmers also know how to program games. In fact, some of these people are some of the best game players because they know how the game is programmed. 
um, and, uh, and all this tokenomic stuff around doing activities and winning things, and winning things of value. This has been going on in games for decades. And these programmers are now realizing we can, we can game society now, so to speak. And so when you're talking about how these things are valued, it's, it's all about demand and it's all about um, uh, um, supply. And the demand can be very hard to measure because it can be uh, like, these, like some of these NFTs, uh, like Board 8 Yacht Club and, and CryptoPunks, that, that uh, people are asserting values by being a, a member in these groups and owning these tokens. Um, it's social status, it's social cred. You know, you're, you're, you're in the, you're in the club. Everyone wants to join. It's, it's, it's honestly, you almost have to think about how people behave in high school to begin to sort of wrap your heads around, around how they're valuing these, the, 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 these assets. There's, there's a lot of intangible reasons why people are buying these things. Status symbols. Yep. Yeah. I, I'm not a big NFT guy, but my company did a 1000 piece unique art collection last year and I, I bought one just to just to have it <laughs> it's, it's, you know so and, 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 and it was a vanity play for me yeah I mean you know we, we humans have been carving pictures in cave walls for as long as we can you know we had hands probably you could walk um and um that's think of this as digital cave carvings left for a millennia in a weird kind of way. I mean, that, that, that image keeps, keeps coming to mind. It, it somehow feels something like that. It is people are leaving a, a, a permanent mark in the digital landscape as early pioneers. When people study this, they're gonna, they're gonna go in there and, and they're gonna look who, who, were the, who were the important players. History is unfolding, if, if you will. And people wanna, wanna leave their stamp in the, in the record of history. And, and this, this is a way to leave that stamp in a permanent, in the digital space. And, in a very permanent way, not, not a totally permanent way, but one of the most permanent ways we can, we can imagine. So, hey, Alan, can I ask a question yes. to Scott? You bet, Scott. You bet. You may have made it clear, but it wasn't clear to me because I just may have missed it. But in this unfolding of these DAOs and people using NFTs as a way to raise money and, and how do you see accessor specifically taking advantage of that by doing something themselves or is that not appropriate to ask or wait, is that wait, sort of like what's shaping? Wait, can you go back again? But, um, well, sorry, I mean, I'm, I'm just wondering, you're explaining the concept, but I guess what I'm asking is how do you see accessor specifically oh. uh, taking advantage of this concept and this, uh, this market condition or is that being formulated and that's really not appropriate yet? To no, it, it is appropriate. Um, so the, the the net capital offering that we have out there um, for kind of our kickoff, our kickoff threshold of 500K is, uh, is, is, is our minimum that we need to move towards issuing a DAO within a year. Um, the sooner that I can take the IP that we have, where we're attaching contracts to data everywhere it moves so we can solve that royalty and licensing problem, um, it needs to be, it, in order for it to be a successful go to market, it has to be an open an open protocol. Uh, it has to be nonprofit owned. And so uh, we have the IP in the nonprofit. The nonprofit has the wholly armed, the wholly owned accessor, which is the for profit. Um, and it, people that invest in accessor will get tokens from, from, the, from the nonprofit who's governing the standard. So we're taking the more conservative route. We're not, we're not trying to, you know, we're not trying to really push the envelope of what, of what DAOs can do. What we're saying is, is we have this IP and we're going to give it to the community. And the community, in order to have a say in how it works, is going to have to fund the creation of this thing. And that that part we don't have necessarily worked out. We're still trying to, to work through, you know, um, through the community. Um, uh, to find the right consultants. Like there, there are consultants now in, in this space, people that have done, you know, a hundred or more of these. And so they, uh, they kind of know what they're doing. There, there's now law firms that specialize in this. So um, to be clear, yeah, we're, we are um, I'm making, I'm making, I actually updated the, the web pages. So uh, on the bottom of, uh, of the Accessor and Data Freedom Foundation web, web pages, we have the link to Net Capital. And I'm now clearly stating that, that this includes a, a, a SAP, a, a safe, a simple agreement for future tokens. Um, the, the thing we, the problem we've had so far is that we didn't have our patents finished for how this stuff worked with, uh, with blockchains. 
And so we were reluctant to advertise too broadly until really the last month when the, when the, the, the last patent came through. So now we're much safer. We can, um, we can uh, advertise, we can market the offering. We can, in fact, this morning, yesterday, I ran our first LinkedIn uh, ad for this education series. Um, and we, we were running around a 2% click-through rate, which is significantly higher than the 0.2 to 0.4 click-through rate that LinkedIn generally you know, predicts for these things. <clears throat> So you know, the, the, we we've been we've been kind of in stealth about the fact that this is a Web three play uh, because we didn't have the patents yet, but now we do, and now we can start we can start marketing. I think uh, it was uh, in twenty four hours we, we picked up twenty four uh, in, investor groups that were targeted um, on LinkedIn, and we picked up twenty four uh, registrants. So, so to yeah. piggyback on that, Alan, uh, just yeah. because related, and then Maribel will go to you. And the reason I'm doing it before Maribel is just because just we're reaching that hour mark. And then whoever wants to stay on and talk, we can do this. Um, I want to talk about two things. For those of you who are coin carriers, um, yes, there is something that Alan, and I'm working with Alan on, that has a vet investment potential. And if you want a deeper dive on that, we're happy to talk to you guys about it. And the answer to your last uh, question, Mike, that just came through is yes. Um, so, but I want to talk about one of the reasons why, uh, you, you can look at this investing that we're, or this offering that we're giving is different. And I want to go towards coin carriers here. Some of you might not be, but I want to reference the coin carriers here. And I want to reference bylaw, uh, number 11, which states, uh, Alliance first members should always seek to do business within the Alliance before offering or seeking services from outside of the Alliance. This serves as a protection since all members of the Alliance share common core values and strive to provide an abundance exchange to others. We are also highly skilled and have been taught that the same success laws and principles that are enjoyed. That's not all of it, not all of it, but that's part of it. And what I just shared there does not negate your own personal responsibility and accountability, okay? I'm going to go into a deeper dive on this and offer to coin carry shortly. I was asked to by multiple people and then uh, the vice chair brought it up too recently and I want to explain how I invest okay and whether you go down the list like well no I need to know this this and this that might be true right now but I've worked with thousands of people in the last 12 years to expand them at least to the understanding of and utilization of slightly if not more on how I invest I created a company around this back in 2019 so anyway basically I take investing as an education into myself all right uh, it's not what I do, it's how I show up and flow through what I do that I bank my belief on and taking steps, risks, whatever you want to call it. So I know for myself that I'm consistent, I'm determined, I'm disciplined, etc. And this is who I am. Basically, this is who I am. And it's not dictated by circumstances whatsoever. It's who I am. It doesn't matter what industry it's in, doesn't matter what reason, arena it's in, it's who I am. So I know my first gauge of do I do something is, well, I'm going to need to learn this. Am I determined? Of course I am. Am I disciplined? Absolutely. You know, I have a track record of all that stuff. That ROI is who I am, right? So it's not what I'm showing up and flowing through. It's me and how I show up and flow through it. So I want to give you a couple examples. Like for one example, I'm heavily invested in Alan. Um, I'm on the board of directors with the, the Data Freedom Foundation. Did I have a single inkling of an understanding of what he was doing when I made the decision to do that? Nope. Right? Did I quickly understand it from a musician perspective and the royalties aspect and all that? Yep, I did. I saw the value right then and there, but I take the steps usually based on who I am, not what I'm stepping into. Another example, uh, within probably 18 months ago, Mike, I'm not sure, but Mike and I had an 18 or excuse me, a six, six figure win in an industry I had zero knowledge in with terminology that I'd never heard in my life. I had Google sitting open daily on calls with people that normally I wouldn't talk to, you know, like ever Googling the words they were saying just to understand on the fly what they were trying to say. No idea. And I really don't remember a lot of that because I just came in. I was me. I know who I am. I'm consistent. I'm determined. You know, I am uh, disciplined. I can do all that stuff. It's not the industry. Okay. So investing, a lot of people say it's emotional. I think the statistic, it's like at least 66% emotional. It could be higher than that, but it's comes down to understanding yourself. Yes. You do want to understand what you're investing in, but it doesn't supersede understanding yourself and how much you under yourself does dictate what you learn and what you're doing. 
if you're full of fear, if you're full of like, oh, I'm not quite good enough. Oh, I have all these regrets. I've done things in the past. I've screwed up. Example, 2018, 2018, uh, in the first two months I was involved in crypto, I, I lost, you could say, or was scammed out of, I'm using air quotes because these are the other terminologies that I'll use, out of $300,000, okay? Well, where I watched people for a year in different groups talking about what had happened, they got scammed, I'm never gonna do anything like that again, like ranting. I didn't feel scammed, I felt educated and massively curious, which turned into me making 300, or excuse me, $3 million in the next 15 months in that space. Okay, because I know myself and I understand that when I invest in anything, money is a result in what I'm investing in. How I show up and flow through it supersedes the result. So when I invest, I'm investing in myself, a deeper understanding of myself, of that ROI that never leaves me as I gain it, right? And secondary, I'm learning and understanding about what I'm investing in. So I know that is not the typical person, okay? I can count four people on this call that I'm actually currently working with on this, these concepts. I call them concepts right now because they're not part of you yet. Although they are part of you, you just don't know it. And I will be doing a series on this for coin carriers. But the key thing is bellwether first. That's one reason to look deeper into this. Um, two, um, understanding yourself and seeing how you show up, becoming aware of it and improving your show up and flow for the next time. Most people do things, they're fearful. So they reinvent the fear and they re-experience the fear. So again, that's me. I'm not a financial advisor. I'm not saying it's impossible to jump into the, the space that I live from, but it's improbable immediately. But I want to spark the thought at least and plant the seed on, on what that can mean and how it can help you show up differently in life and thus achieve completely different results that astonish you and put you in awe rather than injure you and further put you in regret. All right, Maribel. Yeah, thank you. I'm going to be fast, I promise. <laughs> So first, thank you very much, because this is a, a topic you're opening my eyes to a totally new world, and I appreciate that. So thank you so much, Aaron, Ellen, Joel, and Mike. Uh, my question is, actually, you answered my first question, which was, okay, is there something going on? So now you say yes. So, okay, I'll look forward to that. The second one, and it's in regard to the DAOs, because I'm, 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 I'm always trying to, whatever I learn with you guys, I try to Google it and start my research. Um, is there something or a source that we, you recommend to start with the DAOs? Because one of the things that I wanted to better understand is how the landscape of them is, is kind of organized yeah. or they focus on specific industries or, and in, in my case, I want to see where could I start, you know, fitting in. So that, that's kind of where I want to go. I think th this has come up several times um, and uh, th that's what I'm going to do. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up with an email. I've been promising to do this and I haven't done it yet. Um, I will, find, yeah. So um, I, I will follow up with an email and pull together a list. Um, I'll see if Joel or, or, or Mike have, or, or uh, Scott, anyone else has any, any, any sources they think are, are positive, but I'll, I'll pull together a list of, of, of stuff for me. And um, what awesome, I also, Mike. yeah. And, and follow me, follow the Accessor and Data Freedom Foundation on, on like LinkedIn. Uh, in particular, um, but I'm also on Twitter and and uh, and Facebook. But I think I'm going to focus mostly on LinkedIn initially because I was the only one. Of Thank you, because because it might be a bit overwhelming, you know. Just there's a lot of information, so I want to kind of make sure that at least I'm using something, you know, more much uh, with a certain level of formality, <laughs> if that makes sense. Good. Yeah, I, I'll put together. I'll make sure I send an email out with some with some, awesome. with some stuff. And, um, and I, I read, I read pervasively, like when we did the NFT sessions, I had like some 400 NFT articles that I'd collected over six months. Um, I'm, yeah, some people, some people hoard things and I think I hoard information. And, um, I think I had like some 200 on that on DAOs. It, it's actually, it's, it's fascinating just to sort them by date and look at the titles and you can kind of glance at them. You can see which ones are, are, are hype and which ones are positive, and which ones are negative. And you can see how they're shifting over time. Um, it's interesting just for me to just kind of picture that, but, um, uh, I need to be, um, converting that work into social posts so I can send out to, you know, to people that are following us, uh, what I think are high quality, you know, writings on these things. This is a lot of junk, right? Um, but, but occasionally there's a good, someone's writing something very insightful, you know, that I'm, I'm deciding I want to keep a copy of. 
So what I need to do is convert that into, into a social media flow. So you guys, uh, people that are following us can, can kind of follow along, so to speak. Alan, can I talk about junk for a second? Yeah, go ahead. It's interesting and no offense to anybody who follows CN, CNBC, Bloomberg, Forbes. I, I read those as well, but, but some, some of the top financial publications are really not good for this type of learning. Um, I don't know if anybody else has any opinions on that. <laughs> I've been doing exactly the opposite of what they recommend for the last four or five good. years. <laughs> Thank you, Mike. That, that that's that that about sums it up <laughs> everyone <laughs> yeah they, they've actually had a series on uh the the today show uh lately about cryptocurrency a daily uh segment so it's been yeah. i've at least been able to understand yeah, that just because of you alan could no, you no uh, and all kidding aside but it, it really is a different set of sources and and uh authority so i i would trust people like alan and, and joel and others in this space more than i would trust mainstream uh, just because of the way they're providing the information where it's coming from just my personal opinion yeah so i didn't i uh, from what today's show was uh, presenting i didn't find anything that was uh contradictory to anything that alan has uh shared with us and it's very high level it's, it's nowhere uh, nowhere near as deep as you've gotten into but yeah it, it they can't you know, right. they have five minute segments. You know, th this has taken us really right. what five one hour sessions to get here. This is a lot. This is this is like a day of, of sitting with people to under. Can you uh, understand this? Put a uh, slide number nine back up. Let's see. You, you remember the slide number? Let's see. It's a curse. <laughs> uh, nine yes okay where can you find something like this that lists these these coin market cap what coin market cap coin market cap okay yeah yeah it, it's it, it there's an endless supply of information max i i i'll um i'll just jot some things down and send it out to you guys actually i do want to say i do want to give you one one thing where's where's chat for a moment and you pull that up. I want to give everyone uh, uh, three articles coming out of the, the, how VCs are looking at these cap tables and how they're doing the, their analysis. So let me, uh, how am I going to do this? Um, where are my notes? Let me do it this way. Um, Notes and here they are. So these are these are three articles that I think are great for people to see if it does all three at once. That's kind of ugly. Um, these are three different articles that are talking about VCs and how they're talking about the cap table and the, and the, uh, the two, two different kinds of cap tables, the equity and the, and the token. Um, and how VC is using the crypto token. So it's the three different authors that, that are writing about 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 this now. Um, it's um, it's it's almost turning into a situation, from what I can tell, where the big VC firms they're not even investing anything unless unless they're they're getting tokens at the same time. Um, because of the of what we explained to you guys, there's there's limited dilution, <clears throat> and there's high liquidity of their initial investment, and you, we just we've never seen that. Before. And, and it pays to go to be early. It pays to be willing to invest on literally just a white paper. It's fascinating, but that's that's what's happening. So I wanted to give you guys some some documents to to read about that further. So some where are the financial? Uh, one's a medium article, and another one is. Uh, did you put them in the uh, chat box? Yeah, I did in the chat box. Well, they didn't they show. Up. They're not showing up. Maybe you. Oh PM'd. wait a minute! I see what I did. <laughs> All right, let me fix it. Hey, Alan, get out. Thank you, something. Alan. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> you got <Yeah>. it. <laughs> yeah. You know, yes, Scott. I, I just took comments. One is I was at that uh, blockchain conference and they specifically had media people up there that are on YouTube and other things that are nothing but blockchain and distributed ledger and Bitcoin uh, news. 
they specifically highlighted that they're being blocked and censored by Instagram and all these other big players. There seems to be a real thing going on uh, to not want a lot of people to be educated and the, the normal media may or may not be part of that. Who knows? But those guys were saying it's really happening to them. That's one thing. And the second thing was that in my own investigation, I don't find information glued together the way that Alan does. He puts it, presents it. And I learned, I, I don't have to agree with it, he says, which so far I don't. I mean, I, there's been some I don't agree with, but it doesn't matter because I'm being presented with the information in the backup. So I find, I find his presentation to be extremely important. Thank you, Scott. Yeah, well, because, because I'm looking at it as a product manager is, is the point, you know? Uh, the, the experts, um, you know, to talk to the next group of adopters, who may, and many of you are on this call, you're, pretend, you're the next group of potential adopters, um, you have to talk to you guys differently than the way the experts have already talked to the people who came before us. Um, uh, and that's what product managers do. And so it, it, to me, this feels very natural. This is, this is the way we, we, we look at, at, at an environment and we try and pinpoint the right opportunities. That's our jobs is to do this, is to guide a, a company. A company will delegate to us the capacity, you know, the, the, the authority in many cases, um, sometimes soft authority, unfortunately, but the authority, or at least the responsibility, they love giving us the responsibility um, of growing the market share and growing the profitability. Um, and so we, we just live in, in these spaces that we've, we've been doing this since web one and into web two and now into web three. And so it's, it becomes really easy to see these emerging themes and see how all the parts fit together. So thank you guys. You know, it's fascinating. Uh, when Aaron asked me to start doing this back in December, I really didn't think I had anything to teach anybody because I'm not an expert. Honestly, I, I really did. And then we, we did the first session and, and I realized, oh, well, wait a minute, I have, I have lots I want to talk about. I, I, we can do 12 sessions. Um, and so here we are. So, you know, it's almost... It, it, uh, it, I, you are helping a lot of people, Alan. Yeah, but I'm helping okay. myself too. <laughs> it, it, I'm telling you guys, I'm helping myself too because the, the process of going through this really helps me clarify my own thinking. Yeah, and Alan, the fact yeah. that you come from product management you are able to give us the behind the scenes information and insights that uh, somebody else who is just an advisor would never be able uh, to give us. Yeah, because, because all the pieces of information I'm getting from everywhere are all valid inputs. Right. They're all and, market and, inputs. You know? And so the questions that I've asked you are typical questions that I would ask any uh, product manager when they're trying to explain uh, their product or roll out a solution or something. Uh, and you've been very good at explaining this. That's because of the, of the perspective you come from. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I didn't know it. It, it. This is kind of a bellwether gift or an Aaron gift to me. Thank you, Aaron. You know, like, well, we're all here. We're, we're a little <laughs> kumbaya and some hugs. No, I mean, really, I, I didn't know that I could do this um, or that I would be good at it until I started doing it. So, um, you know, but it's, it makes cool. sense to me now. I gotta, I, I gotta add on that for a second, Alan. What's cool is I saw it in him, right? And that's one of the things I do. I inspire people to be who they are, right? Yeah. And he actually called me up after it, emotional and just like thankful and grateful. It was it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And 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 you know, Aaron talked about you know what we learn about this. You know, every time we realize, you know, there's only four thousand, five thousand people that have tried to do well that have successfully done this before us. That's enough to know that you know by the time people were heading off to California in wagons and five thousand went ahead of them, or at least five thousand made it, right? That's now we got a trail, right? Well, you know, the and, and that, <laughs> right? You know, and and there is a point at which you know it's it's, it's enough of a well worn well worn path uh, that that you can it, it's it's worth the risk, yeah, right? And um and uh. And for us, it's about it's about being being able to teach others how to do this. Like 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 how like we now know we have to grow a community to forty thousand members. So now the question is, well, how do we do that? Well, we're going to learn how to do that, right? So um, and so all these all these it's not just that we're learning how to get from you know A to Z. It's we're learning how to get from A to B and B to C and C to D and D to E. And when we're finished, we're going to have a lot to 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 show other people. And, and Aaron and I actually giggle when we talk about this. We can't, we can't wait. And, 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 and that's what the community is about, right? 
to reiterate yeah. again, when I first started working with Alan, I had never even heard the term Web3. All right. So <laughs> you guys understand. I and I I whether they call it their gut, their intuition, Mike, maybe you have thoughts on this too, but early adopters typically live by the the okay they say yes and then they figure out why they said yes it's a it's a feeling it's a i don't know for me it's an intuitive thing but mike what would you call that and you're because i know you've done a lot of startup work and invest yeah i i do call it intuition it's a self-awareness it's the old jump off the cliff and build the plane on the way down and that's how a lot of the people that i've seen <laughs> things are doing it self-awareness yeah. <laughs> when mike, when mike yeah. invited me into the, the yeah. six-figure deal that we ended up doing together I freaking said I jumped off the cliff, not even knowing what I was doing, <laughs> what I was jumping into. I don't think any of us did. Yeah, <laughs> yeah right. <laughs> it was great. Uh, but if, but if you, you do it with the right people, if you do it with the right people, it's fun. Yeah. And that's what I've learned. Yeah. Right. Totally. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Yeah, and, uh, Max, did you have more questions? Was your hand still just up? My bad. I didn't. Uh, I didn't notice that. That was or was cool. it a high five for another yeah. well done? That too. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well done. Was anybody else? Hey, Mark. Man, I haven't seen you in a long time. We got to see you too. Wow. Definitely. Definitely. Crazy. I really appreciate the time, everybody. Um, there was a great, great uh, presentation, Alan. I learned a lot. I was great. wondering, um, have you? Are there any uh, places that have formalized DAOs legally as an entity? Because you, you mentioned, you know, without a, a formal legal structure, you can't sue or be sued and that sort of thing like i stumbled across wyoming offering a dow llc mm -hmm. i didn't know if there was any other places that you knew had, had done such a thing or no, outside yeah the the, the, that would be for the people who are trying to who are trying to do the maximalist thing where there's they're trying to run the organization without a board and without it without management to some extent they're really trying mm -hmm. to push it but uh you know um the, the on the opposite end of the extreme i call it kind of the, the, the pragmatist who uh uh who did they have a board in fact, we, we even have a pairing of a nonprofit with a for-profit. Uh, so we have the, you know, the IP is held by the nonprofit. It has a board, it has a management team. We have a for-profit that will have a board and a management team. Um, and, uh, and really what the token holders are getting is a vote on the code. We're not going to put anything more on, on in these in the smart contracts than what is required to have the community sort of control the code from a product management perspective. That's kind of a minimalist perspective. So um, I think if you take it uh, the way we're doing it, you, we're, we're, we're weaving it into existing legal structures so everything works. Um, but then the maximalists, uh, and I applaud them for what they're doing, but the law needs to catch up to that. Hmm. Yeah. So you, it, it, what you're saying is true. Um, and there are there are there there are questions, uh, but there are ways of doing it where uh, where you, you you avoid all those risks. Got it. Yeah. Thank you. And and that's nice. It's nice that that's the four thousand five thousand that gone before us, right? Um, that's that's the fact that you can now hire law firms to specialize in this space. It's 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 maturing at, at, at that at that rate. Otherwise, it wouldn't do it. The, the IP we have of attaching contracts to data as it moves. Uh, it's too important. Uh, when I talk to, um, I talked to too many investors whose eyes sort of glazed over and, and we're, we're like, we could surveil everyone's data. And I was, no, right. It's the antithesis so, of what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. <laughs> so, you know, uh, and I knew that I wouldn't be able to stop them. Um, and so I was forced to make, to, to make, to, to choose to go the nonprofit route and figure out how to make that work. But I went into it knowing that, that, that the foundational parts were there with these DAOs. Um, it just had to mature enough to, 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 to get to a place, right, where a group of us can now go and do it. And, and, and the legal structures are sufficiently robust that, um, that it's, it's safe enough to actually do, that I'm willing to put the IP into it. So. All right. Anybody else have any other questions? I'm going to turn off.